Hey everybody, this is Brad Dyke saying hi, how you doing? Uh, I'm just reaching out to you real quick. Uh, today's little experiment is going to be based on logic design and then eventually from logic design into a Proxmox deployment which will then lead to a um, kind of a simulator that emulates um, what we call um, an AWS cloud environment that can allow us to develop some pre-testing models for like uh, Docker and uh, DevOps tools so I can develop a test bed for some work that which I'm doing but I thought it would be really interesting to show you some of the things that which are being done here to get you ready to do such a thing so the first thing is about Proxmox is your resources resources means CPU memory and capacity so you have in this case I have a DL386 Gen 9 platform and I'm going to use for my subservices, which is a little slower platform, but just as capable, is this uh, Dell Series 710. And I have to configure these guys up to match fairly the same about capacity, uh, reserve storage local versus my NFS storage, which is down here on the DX720. And um, that will give me the ability to stage um, the two node cluster configuration that I want for Proxmox. Now this is going to be 10 gigabit bandwidth with about 64 gigs to 124 gigs of allocation space wise so that will give us some resources to work with but we're going to be using VPUs uh, or I should say vCPUs and VRAM and so on and so on so the divider ratio of how much you're really going to use is going to be dictated on how you can figure that out. So uh, that's just your resources for now and that's what I'm going to focus on right now. So I found that this unit was basically lacking in, in capacity so I'm reformatting it just a hair bit more so that it's going to be able to uh, match fairly evenly with the resources. I'll get the same number of processors, but not quite as fast of processors down here as I have up here. And I'll use these as my forefront, and I'll use these as my secondary services platforms for Proxmox. So with that being said, the next thing I have to focus on is disk storage. That's right. Lots and lots and lots of disk play. So what we'll do here is we're going to go through a little bit of exercise with disks and getting them prepared and getting them set up. I'll talk to the nature of how this is done and I'll point the camera down to the disk so you can see the different varieties here. Now I am a surpluser of old hard drives. Okay, So that's an important detail to understand that uh, when you're doing this kind of stuff you want to make sure that number one you have plenty right? because things go bad. That is very true. And secondly, that your type classes are present because you have to pay attention to the nature of this. Now these are 10,000 or 15,000 RPM hard drives that are enterprise level drives. I always buy these in bulk, usually five at a time. Uh, four is what I need, but I want a fifth one because you don't know how long the life is on these, so you always want to build in a little extra redundancy. Sometimes people will do RAID 5. Uh, which is fine. You can do RAID 6 if you really don't trust the drives. That gives you two parity set drives in case you know you have more than one drive go bad on you. The next thing you want to pay attention to is rev release date and of course the size of the drive. Now when I get my drives, you notice here I put in big letters what size it is. Why? Because they're my drives. And if you ever get any of my drives, you won't have any problem with knowing exactly what you're dealing with here, right? <laughs> right. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to maintain at least four 512s, that's 512 gigs each, drives, and one or two terabyte of spared SSD drive. Now remember, whenever you use an SSD drive, you're going to saturate your bus with I.O. So you have to remember that. So you can't just put a whole bunch of SSD drives and then expect to have this god-awful amount of uh, performance, only to find out, sadly, that you just don't have that performance there. And uh, that becomes an issue, obviously, because What's happened is your SS drives, your SSD drives, I should say, uh, are basically saturating the I.O. controller and maximizing the I.O. potential uh, for that device. So um, what I usually do is I'll take a single SSD drive or two in RAID 1 configuration, make them available uh, depending on the criticality of the system. And uh, then what I do is... Um, in this case, I'm going to have a one tera, uh, I'm sorry, a two terabyte junk drive, which is basically just a repository drive to hold images, things I don't care about, and if I lose them, I don't care. Uh, it's just 
basically a, a large disk dumping ground and I'll use an SSD drive for that to allow me to be able to equalize um, capacity without having a lot of extra power consumption going on. So here I've got uh, multiple 600 gig drives which I'm working with now to set up and I'm depopulating these 30450 drives getting them out of the equation and they're good too great for boot drives absolutely good for the boot drives but um, not necessarily um, great when you have a large number of them you, you get capacity but you pay the price because it's not cheap to power them when you got 30 or 40 or 50 of them and you don't get the returns that I think you really want when you look at those kind of things going forward but I do keep all my drives in proper sequences so it's easy for me to find them, set them in place, and get them in a good place. Uh, so I can quickly pull on them when I need them for my next whatever. Because my lab is constantly in a rebuild state. And if it's not being rebuilt, then I'm not doing what I consider my job in learning new things. So, if you're probably noticing, I'm only putting three screws on average into the drive bays. Um, I really shouldn't do that, but when you take out 64 screws and you put 64 screws back in, it really sucks. Okay, what do we got here? Another 450. Okay, so I've got drives that I need. That's good. And I also will have, uh, at my discretion, the ability of having a one terabyte drive just for junk. Don't need it to do anything else. I just need just a place where I'm not using crucial high capacity space, right? And get that in play. So, but normally I do put, <laughs> back to my original topic of screws, um, four screws in, because unfortunately I hate to say it, it does matter. Uh, just sometimes we get lazy. Just so many drives, you know. You look at my rack, I've got at least a hundred. And I've done a hundred one night. That was really fun. Not really. But point is that um, technically speaking, spinning hard drives are acoustic based drives. In other words, they're sensitive to sound waves. And uh, so when you choose to still use mechanical drives because you have them, you need to understand the nature of what you want to work with here. So with that being, with those basically being finished, so the goal with, in this particular configuration, I've got my four 600 gigs drives, which will match up to the 512s in the HP. And then I have a one terabyte standard drive, just as my dump ground drive to keep my, basically my 1.4 terabyte of capacity in the, in the clear, if you know what I mean. So, with that being said, I should have now sufficiently enough resources to be able to build out roughly 32 uh, virtual machines per unit, and that's pretty average. Um, you know, these are decent core stack processors. I've got dual processors in each, and uh, it will give me the capacity that what I'm looking for. I'll probably add a third Proxmox component to this as well. Um, I just haven't decided how exactly I want that to be done. So hang on a second. Okay, so now what we've got to do is we've got the DL, which is right here, and the uh, the DL uh, 380 uh, Gen 9. Uh, this is a Gen 9, right? Yeah, yeah Gen 9. And um, it has basically four 500 gig drives. And these are performance drives, so they're going to perform really well. I'm going to put those in. Those are 500 gigs each, 512 to be exact. And then we've got the one, ter uh, the one dual terabyte drive here, which is a dump drive. In other words, we're, we're doing that to successfully stage uh, a local dumping zone. I'll have NFS out there as well, running on my um, 10 gig connection for the, for the true NAS platform. But now we're going to do the same thing here for this unit. I'm going to lock him down. Here are the multiple 600 gig drives, which will give us a little bit more capacity than the uh, 1.5, which is up here uh, in, straight five, in a RAID 5 stripe set here. Uh, and here we have uh, basically 
uh, more like a 1.8 uh, uh, terabyte footprint with redundant model drive in there and of course we have the one terabyte just for dumping out there and of course if you notice I separated the channel busing put these four on the first set and I put this on the second set of the channel busing so that it's going to be able to work uh, more successfully but let me confirm that let's see one two three four yeah that's right that's right yeah yeah you have to make sure you got the right drive orders when you do that so now we're basically ready except for one thing this is, the network has been down for a little bit so uh, our 10 gigabit architecture and overhead uh, for these two sets of clusters need to be built on the back end so I'm gonna have a high bandwidth connection here and I got a high bandwidth connection here going up to the 10 gig infrastructure which will give me overall bandwidth to match that of, of the NAS platform but I need to double check the nature of those configurations to make sure that they're supportable yeah so this one is going to require a 10 gig NIC right here so I'll have to do that next so I'll disconnect this and the power and that way we can prepare to extract the unit and then I'll put a uh, 10 gigabit NIC in there uh, which will be a GBIC style footprint and uh, that will give us the ability to do what we want to do stand by for a second okay so we've got the 10 gig NIC in play now and uh, we'll put that down and secure that and so we've got everything else set up here, we've got our CPUs, this is a very thin, very efficient little chassis. I've had, I've used it for a few times, and actually this is a 620, I stand correct, not a 720. Uh, it's actually a newer generation than, the, than I thought was a 710. But uh, it's good to go, it's got plenty of capacity for what I want to do with it, I don't need to do a lot with it, but I do need it to do its specific tasks. So, with that being the case, I'm going to put it back in the rack. Okay, so we're starting the process of booting up devices, as you can see here, and I've got my drive environments coming up now, which I'm going to wipe clean and start over with. But what I'm also looking for is my HP unit. So we'll switch the... Let's see if I've got it here. I think the HP is a little bit more temperamental when it comes to video display. There it is. I was wondering where it was. So we're going to be able to do, um, we have to reconfigure the drive stacks, make sure they're all right. I got 192 gigs of capacity, piles and oodles of uh, CPU t uh, processors. So we're doing good on that front. And uh, they're 2680s, 28 cores total. So that can give me quite a bit of firepower. And that would be this guy right here. And then this one down below is a little less powerful, but uh, is able to do what I want it to do as well. It'll give me the template. I'm gonna give this 610 to my son, because he has some 610s down here as well, eventually, because those are his servers. And uh, those are for him. And this will allow me to bring in my 730s and populate them up so I can add those into the equation, which would be probably one of the second uh, units I'll bring into the unit or a seven or 7390 as well but right now we've got a pretty good basis in play and uh, what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna stop this video here at this point because this was about showing you what does it mean to break things down in a certain way and do pre configuration setups in such a way that when you're working with hard drives and memory and and, and your formatting and get your connectivity up it's actually pretty simple the first thing you want to do is you want to do a piece of pa uh, pencil and paper take your resources and start breaking them down you get them in a range of what you want to do now you either do apples to apples as in you want to have two identical nodes working together as a cluster for high availability and failover 
or you do what's called leader uh, weaker and that is basically you have a lead platform it's very fast and proficient has some functionality of failover with a lesser unit that doesn't do quite as much workload but is there if you need to maintain a presence and then you can do you know two equals and one lesser or two equals and two lessers it just depends on what you want to do now the recommendation of why you have two or more in in professional environments it would be three we refer to it as the three-in-one strategy you have your test environment where you can screw anything up you want rock and roll have it have fun learn some new stuff then you have quality which means now it's time to quality and clean up everything you've done make sure it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do and that you can deploy it effectively and then ops which is or your operations that allows you to bring all your stuff to the front forefront and you can begin the process of um, providing services to whoever you're working with now the key thing about this is this is where you can have a platform where you can build DevOps tools on the sideline that will manage how these tiers will handle your workload. So like I said, if you build the basics at ground zero, not a big deal. Go ahead and do so. Uh, at the same point in time, you will take the time and configuration wise, take the steps that you need to do to make sure that you've got everything the way you want it to be. Hang on for just a minute here real quick. Sorry about that. Unfortunately, my TrueNAS started powering up and it wasn't ready because its disk arrays were offline while it was powering up and I didn't want to go through the recovery process of bringing back 24 drives back online. So I had to quickly interrupt this video to quickly fix that problem. Anyways, so back to what I was saying. So when you're in an environment like this, you have these resources, right? You're planning them out, you structure them in the, in the right accordance, and now you can start to have your base cloud infrastructure, Proxmox, VMware, whatever. It does not have to be an a, uh, somebody like AWS or Google or Alibaba and so on. It can be right here in your own back door. You can use small boxes like uh, I have up there, the, the uh, 7100s. You could use them, a whole bunch of little ones, and they can give you lots of firepower. Uh, they're fast, they're efficient, they're running NVMe and they're running high performance RAM so they have their own value and benefit but they do have one gig pipes so you have some limitations there. Or you can do what I'm doing and that's dual 2U uh, chassis servers to give me the number of processor stacks that I want to have to do my test environment. Now with that being said I still have three brand new platforms I haven't put online yet which will be crucial too because they'll provide me some additional functionality that uh, my older hardware does not provide, such as the 720 and so on. But it's still really great stuff and it works really good. And I'm, I'm still toying with some strategies out there, if you know what I mean, to kind of get things set up in a clean way. But with that being said, I'm gonna sign off on this part of the hardware side equation of bringing up a fairly decent firepower platform um, from the ground, from, from scratch, and getting it started. My next video will talk to you about the Proxmox configuration setup and how I'm going to use a controlled segmented pipe versus a split segmented pipe for bandwidth on my network side. And with that being said, I'm going to sign off. You guys take care and God bless.